organizing comedy for tonight. And this is Mira, a very familiar face that you would have seen over and over again. I know it gets very tiring, but it's always very refreshing to have her. You, you've definitely heard me. I've been <laughs> shouting at some point, at one point. She's yeah. going to kill me tonight. Um, hi, everyone, and welcome to She Says. Um, who's, um, who's here for the first time? Raise your hands. Yes, well, welcome to She Says, and we're going to introduce um, who we are. Um, we're really excited to have you here. It's a very intimate group. Um, we um, generally, this is, some, this is a new topic for us. This is not something that we've ever addressed. Um, and I'll explain why we are going into this topic. Um, quite recently, it was Pink Dot in Singapore. Um, and the press around it was interesting a lot of the time. Um, you see a lot of positive family faces supporting Pink Dot. But there was very little said about gender neutrality, female pleasure, sexual health, sexuality, gender. And this is a topic that we want to discuss just to be, um, and it's something that is important to all of the women at She Says and with the community at large. So tonight, it's a small group of people and we want, we have an amazing group of people who are going to be up on the panel. They have created sex products here, uh, sexual devices and toys in Singapore. They've been fighting for the rights of sex workers, um, many of whom I just found out as well today from Vanessa, who's from Project X. To be a legal sex worker in Singapore, you have to be female and 21 to 35. Keeping in mind that our, I'm Singaporean, so I'm going to say it again, but um, keeping in mind that our government is the state it is and the rate of gender parity I wonder why they made that age group and chose that demographic when choosing se sex workers to be female between the ages of 21 to 35. Keeping in mind that male sex workers exist in Singapore, they are all illegal, which also means that when they are victims of crime like robbery, rape, um, uh, physical violence, they have no rights because they technically sometimes shouldn't even be in Singapore, so they're not going to fight for themselves. So those are some of the topics I'm going to be talking about today. Um, and we're super excited to have you. So would you mind just clicking the keyboard? Because I don't, oh, you have, oh, well, there you go. She is useful. There you go, Sarah, off to you. Um, okay, so those of you who are here for the first time, welcome. Always excited to have new people here. Um, and those of you who have joined us before, welcome back. Always excited to have you around as well. Um, so just a quick introduction to She Says. Um, very global creative network. Um, for women, we focus on women within the creative, digital, and um, te technology industries. Um, we're global, we've got 13 chapters around the world, with Singapore being one of our first um, Asian chapters. We're quite strong in, this, in the Asian market, so Singapore has 3,000 members, including all of you. So if you have friends, always welcome to have them join us as well. Um, we're we're always um, having panel sessions and um, social nights as an effort to, sorry, as an effort to always uh, to bring our community to get together. Um, so for you to come together as a family, for you to make new friends, for you to meet new people. So we're always um, engaging our, our members to, and always encouraging you guys to come and join us at every month's event that we have. Over to you. So um, today we kind of briefly mentioned what the chat is about. Now after this, there is always our standard networking session. Um, so what we'll do is that we'll have the panel and keeping in mind that it is a fairly intimate crowd, it's a really interesting topic. If we generally have it for about 45 minutes, but we can stretch it as well um, till they kick us out. Um, but with the networking, just to let you know, we've got a couple of recruiters in the room. The recruiters, can you just put your hands up? There you go. There's one. All right. There was some, some more. Oh no, you know how it's like. But um, no, but we do have um, JK, fr um, who's um, from Talent2, um, who's here, and she'll be, if you have, if you're looking for a role, let her know. The other company that's also looking is called, it's a technology company that focuses on marketing tech, who's looking for a business development manager. Um, they're looking as well, and they're specifically looking for women because they're looking to have more gender parity in their business as it grows in Singapore and then into ASEAN and Asia Pacific. So if you have any other roles that you're looking to hire or fill, let Sarah or myself or one of the She Says Girls know and we'll issue it in our newsletter and on our Facebook page to 3,500 members and growing. Um, 
So I'm going to introduce myself. I'm Mira. Um, I am. I get confused sometimes when I have to explain myself. Um, so um, I work at Accenture. I'm in digital and innovation. I look at um, product strategy and development um, for transportation, aviation, life sciences, and beauty as well. Um, beauty is an odd one, but it's actually quite similar in terms of the supply chain to life sciences for background. But I also run a street photography business, um, and we, together with Lizzie and Vicky and Sarah, we run She Says. Over to you, Sarah. Yep, and I'm Sarah. I'm an account manager at Double Verify, which is an advertising technology company. We focus on media quality, media verification. I used to come from um, the media, media buying side of advertising technology, so I have that background as well. So from there, I realized, you know what, there's a lot of like, bots, fraudulent stuff out there, unsafe stuff. So I decided to join the brand safety site and basically focus on how technology can help um, you know, improve your media buying um, plans. So this, these are some of the women um, who um, are active faces at She Says. So the two people I want to call out tonight are actually Sam, um, who's over there, and Kat. Um, who were actually truly responsible for pulling together the speakers, planning everything for this session. So give them a big round of applause. Um, and if you, um, if you want to have a chat with them, just go up. Can you, just, can you guys just put your, don't put your heads down, raise your hands. Thank you. <laughs> um, and you know some of the other women who are there. Alicia is over there with the camera, and she's also at Accenture, and she's one of our designers. Um, and Vicky, Lizzie, Trish, um, are away at the moment, um, but they'll be back in town fairly soon. So JustCo, so JustCo has hosted us for every single event. They've never asked for a dime from us. They always support us with every one of our activities. So massive thanks to them. If you want to know more details, you can go on to our Facebook page and event page, and there is information on how you can get a membership um, or how you could potentially join any one of their community events. Echo Cafe. And we've got the guys behind the thing for providing the food and drinks for tonight. So if you guys want to get drunk, there's beer and wine at the back. And I encourage you to. It's a Wednesday. So that's Sarah, by the way, in case you didn't That's why that. I run the social nights. <laughs> and we've got Michael from Engineers SG for uh, lending us his camera and his expertise behind the camera. So thank you all so much for always supporting all our events and always being there, be the men behind the camera. And we move on to the topic for the day. Okay, so I'm going to bring our panelists up. We can give them a round of applause as they take their seats. <laughs> Don't be shy. There's <laughs> plenty to be shy about. <laughs> All right. Okay, so do we have the slide with the... Oh, can we click it one more time, please? Oh, there we go. There we go. So... These are our fantastic panelists. Um, before we kick off, I'm actually going to get them to introduce themselves, um, where they're from, um, and what their product or their business or what it is that they do, and maybe a mantra about what you live by or what you do. So. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Hi everybody, good evening. Thank you for having me tonight. My name is Vanessa. I'm with the nonprofit organization called Project X. Uh, we are a sex workers' rights organization. So what we do is that we go out to a lot of red light districts in Singapore. We distribute condoms. But more importantly, we try to educate women about what their rights are in Singapore. So if they do face violence, discrimination, or any forms of exploitation, um, we are there to either offer them legal advice or even help them pursue their cases if they have anything um, to bring forward. Um, the motto that I live by is actually, I wish, um, and, and this is also why I was so excited to be here today, is because I do firmly believe that we need to have very open and non-judgmental conversations around sex, sexuality and gender in order to encourage learning and encourage uh, uh, people to share their own different perspectives to encourage um, appreciation of diversity of views in this area. Hi everyone, my name is Martha. I am a relationship counsellor and clinical sexologist. I have a, a doctorate in human sexuality, been in practice almost 10 years now, 10 years as of next year. And uh, I got my master's in counselling last year. I have two other degrees, I have many trainings, 
and I just love studying. And uh, what I, I love more than studying is uh, helping people. Uh, that's why I do what I do. And a lot of people think that I'm uh, sex crazy because I'm a sexologist. Uh, I do love sex a lot. That's why I uh, became a sexologist. Um, but actually, I, 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 more than that, I actually just love helping people to live lives fully and fearlessly. So I feel that uh, sex just happens to be the last fr frontier of uh, truly becoming an adult, of really embracing all aspects of your, yourself. We, we get all kinds of education with our work, with our finances, with uh, fixing, um, fixing cars, whatever, but we don't get much training or much education around our sexuality, at least in Asia. And uh, so what I do is uh, I, I work with couples and individuals in private session and I run workshops of my own. And uh, for the last coming to 10 years, uh, I've been running uh, sexual techniques workshops which are very popular like, like uh, penis massage workshop, vulva massage workshop, blowjob workshop. So people always laugh at me. Um, however, these are always the workshops that are uh, full. <laughs> Because I think everybody, everybody just wants to be better in sex so that they can keep their partner. So I have met people who are, uh, they don't have a partner, they've never had a boyfriend even, but they want to come to these workshops so they can just prepare. And uh, yeah, so I run these workshops. I, I have three books and uh, what else do I do? I have a YouTube channel. I had a podcast for three years, uh, which I stopped this year because I'm not actually a very auditory person. So I can't understand why people want to listen to me. So that's why I stopped. Um, yeah, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Hi, everyone. My name is Dima, founder of Five Is, the smart vibrator. Right? Uh, this is a wearable smart vibrator. I used to work as a software engineer in an investment bank, but I was in long distance. That's how I got the idea. Because uh, for me, in long distance, typically, it's easy for men to release their energy. right? But I realized like, oh, my wife also needs this kind of, uh, she needs to release her orgasm too, right? So um, I couldn't find something that was easy to use. And then finally, that's, uh, I started Fibis as a fun project in the beginning. And my wife was just laugh about it. But later on, uh, the more I learned a uh, little bit more what is important for women, then I realized like, wow, there's so many things that I didn't know about women, right? And that's how I uh, start this uh, project. And then we started to talk to a lot of people, and we, uh, we also talked to sexologists. And then one day, like, the doctor asked me, like, do you know that more than 70% of women did not attain orgasm, even like they're having sex? That's where I was like, wow, I didn't know that, right? That's 70%. Yeah, I mean, like, the numbers is very, but a lot of women say, like, actually, it's more, it's higher than that, right? It, 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 it depends which country you are from, right? Uh, so that was, uh, I got this info when I was uh, in the US. Um, and then that's where I left my job. I do this uh, companies full time. In the beginning, I did this as the, to help the long distance couples to stay intimate. But we realized that the the one that is more popular is actually uh, what we call fantasy comes to life. The idea is that this smart vibrator it uh, vibrate in sync with audiobook. So uh, this is wearable, so women don't have to touch it at all. Just put it there. Uh, you listen to your audiobook, and then when the guy say, I'm touching her softly, it will vibrate softly. When the guy say, I'm touching her heart, then this thing will vibrate hard, right? That's how, that's what we call uh, fantasy council life. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the, my motto is basically what I believe is that uh, the world will be a better place when women can have orgasm as much as men do, right? I think that will make a lot of difference. <laughs> uh, the thing is, like, the more I talk to, to a lot of people is that, some people think like female orgasm is, is not, not something, is, it's not really important, right? Even if you read on the magazine or an article, it, uh, <coughs> when you talk about like orgasm, uh, female orgasm, uh, on the article, is, they always say like the problem with, with the women, right? How, how come it takes so long for women to, uh, to have orgasm, all these things? But I guess that, that is wrong. I mean, like the problem is actually with, I, I wouldn't say it's like a problem with the man, but it, it's just a biology biology thing, right? For, for men, typically it takes like 5 to 10 minutes to attain orgasm, and for women, it takes about uh, 10 to 20 minutes, right? So, so that's why like, we always have this gap. So the thing is like, uh, yeah, basically what I've told most guys is that you need to understand like female orgasm is important too, because it's part of human basic needs. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, hi guys, I'm Sai. Uh, I, I, I don't think I have too much to say. 
But uh, I, I, so I'm an associate creative director in a, in a, a creative agency called Ultra Super New. Uh, we are a Jap Japanese, a Japan and Singapore based agency, so we run two offices. And um, so today I'll be talking, uh, I guess I'm here because I'm going to talk about a few campaigns that we've done about sexual wellness, about uh, how we uh, infiltrated in the different uh, markets uh, over the topic about sex uh, or like parts about intimate women's areas. Uh, so on the sideline, I'm actually a co-founder of this um, e-commerce website called Threats of uh, Artisan and Fox, it's also Threats of Syria. So that's um, sort of uh, a place, an e-commerce website where we enable craftsmen from all around Asia and beyond to, to have better economic opportunities on an e-commerce space. Um, and and uh, I'm also an LGBT advocate, so the next part of that campaign is uh, we've, in Threats of Syria, we've also reached out to Syrian refugees and we've um, uh, addressed some of the, the issues that they have, they have by like, creating products with them in collaboration to, to put on an e-commerce website. Um, but the next part of our campaign is also one, to, one thing to address um, LGBT Syrian refugees and the things that they go through that is hardly expressed out to them. So that's what I do, but the main focus today is to talk about these campaigns and how that um, is uh, interesting for all of us today. Yeah. Hello, uh, my name is Jacqueline. I'm the brand manager for Southeast Asia and head of corporate social responsibility at Smile Makers. Um, so Smile Makers is a sexual well-being brand. We offer a line of premium, award-winning vibrators and lubricants sold exclusively through health and beauty retailers like Guardian and, and Watson's. Um, so I've had a background in working in education from people as like children as young as like preschoolers, um, to high schoolers stu and university students. And I also did my university study um, focusing on the intersection between homoerotic behavior and ancient Chinese literature. So I've always had an interest in sexuality and, and edu education, and so I'm proud to be doing that at Smile Makers. And I think just like re reiterating what everyone else has said that my mantra focuses on um, education and, and the power of that. And so I'm glad to be here and, and speaking because I think it's only through this dialogue that we're able to you know, give out the right um, information and educate the public um, on these very taboo, secretive topics. Um, maybe I'll start with Jacqueline first. Um, now, Smile Makers is an interesting brand because you've taken, um, taken your business model in a different way. Um, you're available on Red Mart at Guardian. I remember just being at Changi Airport, and I was, like, I was actually looking for something, and I saw your vibrator. So I was really confused because I thought it was a toothbrush with a, with a hood on it. I was, then it was a different story altogether. But then, um, but yeah, so can you tell us about the work that you're doing in Malaysia at the moment, in Taiwan, and specifically the work that you've been doing with religious groups in Malaysia and with women and the demographics that you're working with? Yeah, um, so as the head of CSR, I lead and execute all the educational initiatives, charitable donations, and partnerships within the medical and reproductive uh, health spheres. Um, so in Malaysia, for instance, we do, we do a lot of work there um, in terms of education. So we partner with a family planning organization there. It's one of the largest in, in the country. And we give educational workshops to the nurses and volunteers. These are women, oftentimes maybe 50, 60 plus. They've never seen a, a vibrator before because it's considered technically illegal there. Um, but we teach them how to be able to use these products to improve the lives of their patients that they're seeing on a daily basis. Um, and so that's very exciting for us, right? We, we get to see that there are actual medicinal or clinical usages for our vibrators. Uh, and that was not the you know, original intent, but something that we're glad to be doing. We also do a lot of research as well. Um, so right now, we're working with a breast cancer um, association to research the importance of sexuality in the lives of breast cancer survivors. And we hope that this is one of the first studies of its kind within an Asian context, and specifically in M Malaysia. Um, and talking about religious uh, organizations. So we also work with religious bodies to validate sexuality um, as an important component of marital stability. So we were recently, I think in April, invited to the International Islamic University in Malaysia, and we were the only brand there. The other speakers were health professionals or religious officials. And um, there's a photo of, of the co-founder with one of the top imams, apparently, in the, in the country. But we were there to talk about um, sexual pleasure and how important that is to uh, a marriage. 
And so we work with these religious bodies to, to validate this topic and make it you know, more acceptable to be talked about, not just at the ground level, which we readily see, but also at a, at a top level as well. Um, so then I'm going to chuck it over to Dima. Um, when it comes to your brand, like with Smile Makers, you are Singapore-based. There's a team of eight, did you say? And you're in how many markets? 20 markets out of, um, in the Asia region. Whereas with your business, you've lar you're largely in Europe and North America. Yeah, 50% uh, of our sales coming from the US and 30% from Europe. 20% is all over the world. Um, I guess the reason for us like focusing on the US on Europe because our product is mainly focused about the technology side, mm -hmm. which is like it's connect to your phone, remote control. So when we talk to uh, people in the US and Europe, people straight away get it, right? I don't have to explain like what is the benefit of using Fibrator. They all know it. And and in fact like they already own a few. But when it comes to Asia it's a little bit harder. I mean I agree with Jacqueline. So education in Asia is really important and Asia is actually the bigger market compared to the US because like a lot of people, a lot of women that we talk to, like a lot of them you can kind of feel like they haven't really feel like the real orgasm, right? So, uh, so first time when, when we started this company, we talk about five years and, and then a lot of women, especially in Indonesia or Singapore, is like, oh, I don't want to touch that product. Is that like the, from the porn movie or whatever thing, right? That, that is understandable. But um, I got uh, one of my friend's mom is like, she says like, hey, Dima, I can help you to sell to Indonesia. I was like, no, I don't think so. It's po I, I don't think it's possible. But the way she sells is very interesting. She told her friends like, oh, friends, I got this uh, beauty product. Oh, beauty product. It helps you to sleep better, lose weight, looks younger, <laughs> right? And all the moms are crazy. Oh, what is that? And then only that she will explain like, oh yeah, it basically it's a vibrator. Like, like they're still kind of shy, but okay, I, I'll try it. And the next week when they met her, they like they, everyone's like, oh, easy, right? So, so the thing is like, I feel yeah, in in Asia, like like uh, if we give the right uh, education, like like the right information, it's not about like because you're desperate and, and, or you're crazy. It, it, we have to like for for the younger women, we have to tell like uh, yeah, sex is uh, part of human basic needs. It is uh, it is part of uh, I mean, basically, uh, it, it's not because you're you're desperate. It, it, it's healthy. It's good for you. It, it boosts nice your self confidence. Hierarchy. Yeah, so, so yeah, I mean like yeah, if you look at the Maslow uh, hierarchy, uh, sex is actually at the bottom together with uh, food and uh, shelter. Okay. Just, I agree that it is a, a, a very conservative, uh, or it's hard, it, it can be a more conservative market here in Asia, but before we launched with any country, we did our market research and we found that like in Singapore back in 2015, one in five Singaporean women owned a vibrator. Um, and then 62% of the rest were willing to try it out. It's just like the retail environment or existing products were preventing them from doing it. But we, don't, we saw that there was definitely an untapped market here in Southeast Asia, and so that's why we want to start our growth here and expand elsewhere. So maybe I'll turn this to Martha and to Sai as well. When we think about female pleasure, which is largely what both products provide, there is always a sense of shame. Right? I mean, there is always a sense of you will only use a vibrator if you don't have a partner or if you're single, if you're unmarried or you haven't met that, that special someone. Um, how have women that you've worked with or couples that you've worked with addressed this topic of shame or sexuality or female pleasure? And when it comes to the work you guys have done, especially in Japan, you did a really cool program around condoms and Japan is a very closed off culture so I'd be interested to know that but maybe Marta if we could start with you. Uh, a lot of the couples who come to me they are not looking for sex toys they are looking to be able to have sex or have functional sex so the women who are coming they have vaginismus which is a condition that uh, women's vagina shuts down making penetration difficult or impossible so they cannot have sex they have a phobia about sex uh, a lot of women have sexual inhibitions. Then men who come to me, they have premature ejaculation, erectile difficulties, or delayed ejaculation. So I, I assess them and, and make sure that it's not because of a physical health problem. A lot of times, it's the lack of sexual skills. So a lot of people who are coming to me, they are not looking for toys. But having said that, uh, those who do uh, ask me about toys, they often ask about, uh, is it good or bad? Is it normal to have a sex toy? 
can I use sex toy? Should I use sex toy? How do I use a sex toy? And uh, so I think a lot of it is more coming from a place of ignorance and uh, fear of the unknown or fear of what they don't know. And uh, still there's this misconception that uh, sex toys are big and uh, scary and very um, strong and uh, uh, very phallic looking. So uh, that's not true. There are a lot of sex toys now that are very beautiful and um, uh, beautiful colors and designs and uh, cute. And uh, some of them are not even phallic looking. So this is when I try to uh, normalize it for them. And uh, I, I work with a sex shop in Singapore where I, I don't work with them. I don't get a single cent. But what I do is I uh, recommend my clients to go there so that they can have a better experience. Maybe they mention my name. They may get a discount. But I, I feel comfortable working with that uh, shop because I know they have a history of really caring for their um, clients. So... So I try to make sure that there's follow through in terms of uh, the, the easing them into the world of sex toys. So I give them some information here and there and tips on how to choose a sex toy, how to buy a sex toy, uh, things like uh, don't buy it for her, let her decide what she wants and go together and uh, do your research online. You can get it overseas, it might be cheaper, but you can still go to a shop and look and see and feel a toy. And that's very important because if you don't like it, you're not going to use it. And um, in Singapore, because they all look like really like a, you know, mama shop. So a lot of people don't like uh, sex uh, shops in Singapore. But I understand they have their challenges with retail space and uh, stock and uh, all these different brands now uh, coming out. Very, very different uh, industry uh, when it comes to sex toys nowadays. A lot of products are being launched uh, every year now. Oh, uh, hey, hi. Uh, so, actually, the whole topic really uh, aligns to like how we as Asian people, or even like in an Asian territory, how we look at sex in general, like whether it's guy, whether it's girl, how you 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 face that kind of challenges. Um, I mean. Um, I mean, everyone here has, uh, in, in Singapore, by and large, would, and, and marketers and, and communications people here would totally understand, like, the climate here is that, and that is just a representation of Asia, right? That it's always something that either you need to fetishize, fetishize the thing, or you need to come across as, like, hey, I'm a government body, let me talk about reproduction, you know? <laughs> and, like, let me draw you a pretty little padlock, and then you are the key, and, like, that illustrated key is supposed to unlock that padlock and like, yeah, you can unlock more kids. So it's always this place of like, it has to be cute, it has to be funny. Um, it doesn't really talk about the, address, the addresses of actually what it means to have pleasurable sex or just to be able to, to do it. Um, so um, I think what, what was mentioned about Japan, so what we try to do in some of these most closed off markets, right, was let's talk about sex. Okay, it sounds like a song. Um, let's talk about sex in, in a broader perspective of instead of just saying, hey, we're a condom, we're going to come into to, to Japan where it, there is a lot of sex products, as you know, and it's always been in the fetishized kind of market. How can we talk about it in a place where it actually is educational? So um, a lot of Japanese people, that they have kind of like, I won't say by and large, but they do have kind of like a double life thing where one part you have to be really, really polite and conservative and, and come across as you, under, you, you, you are a team player. And another part of it is like the deep down dark. Yeah, like here's like some like sexualized anime and like here's a bunch of sex toys. So how do we marry that too and become a, a, a more of like a national conversation? So using condoms, right? Um, we actually, we understood that a lot of um, Japanese people read uh, newspapers. It's called Shinbun. And Skin, which is the condoms that, um, that the, the, brand, the brand is called Skin, we created newspapers called Skinbun. And we, what we did was basically we disseminated this into um, anywhere, like maybe Shibuya or, or, or wherever, where people are coming across. And they already take newspapers like, uh, on a daily basis as they commute to work. And, and we actually give them something that looks like a newspaper, so you take it. And when you open it up, um, you don't see porn, but you see a lot of interesting conversations about sexual pleasure and sexual activities and creative ways where you can explore um, these 
uh, intimate territories with your partner or with uh, someone else. So, so they will be pleasantly surprised when they open up to see like, oh, there's a lot of information about how I can open up the, the topic of sexual wellness, the, the articles that allude to it, and hey, I get a condom at the end. So that's, that's great. Um, and that really opened up the conversation. We saw the, the, the market share for, for skin actually rise up to be double fold. Um, and it's really understanding um, the, the, the markets that you're playing in. Sometimes it can create taboos, um, like some occupations, and sometimes it creates opportunities. Um, it, it really is understanding how we play as, as um, in an Asian perspective. So I'm going to direct my next question to Vanessa. So just on the back of what Sai is saying about the fact that you have something that you can tend to for information and stuff like this. You work with um, Project X, which is a human rights advocate for sex workers. Do you think that there is enough education for the sex workers to be able to turn into to something that can show them whether, you know, when they're in need, who do they turn to? Is there enough information out there about sex workers? Maybe you want to tell them about what you've been doing in terms of educating the society on, you know, your project. Wow, okay. Um, a lot of points there. I think, uh, uh, firstly, the sex industry in Singapore uh, I'll start with explaining a little bit about the sex industry. I'll make it as brief as possible because it can go up to like one hour. Um, there is a legal part of the industry. So that, those are the legal bottles that you find in Geylang and Little India. There is a quota, which means there can only be 1,000 licensed sex workers in Singapore at any one point in time. They come only from four different countries, China, Vietnam, Thailand, and Malaysia. And I... These are, uh, the license brothel scheme is restricted to these four nationalities. So if you come from any other country, you're not allowed to work in the license brothel. Um, as Mira said earlier, uh, there is an age restriction, so you have to be between 21 and 35 years old. So this is the government's regulation. Um, they do not make it public. You can try to Google it now. You won't find any information on it. Uh, we've asked the government in their face and asked, can you share with us how exactly are you licensing these brothels? Where's the accountability? Um, and, you know, how are you making sure everything goes well? Um, and they won't look us in the eye uh, at all. So we don't know what the policy is. Um, so as you can imagine, a lot of the industry is actually underground or unlicensed illegal sex work, right? If you read the newspapers quite regularly, you'll be seeing this, these two months alone, there has been lots of raids of massage parlors, masquerading, uh, uh, sex joints masquerading as massage parlors, karaoke bars uh, and clubs, um, HDB brothels, I think that was a huge uh, parliamentary debate about HDB brothels uh, earlier this year, late last year. So a lot of the industry has spread out across Singapore. Um, so a lot of our work, while we have, we only need three paid staff um, and everybody else are volunteers, is actually extremely hard for us to reach out to all the sex workers. Um, I'll give you some numbers as to how many illegal sex workers there are in Singapore. In 2016, the government released data to say that they arrested 3,000 unlicensed sex workers. Um, and in my opinion, I don't think they managed to catch even 10% of the, uh, the undocumented part of the industry. So my estimate is that there are at least 10 to 15,000 um, undocumented sex workers in Singapore. Uh, and they come from all over the world. Okay? So majority would come from ASEAN regions, so China, Thailand, Vietnam, all these are, are uh, there are lots of women who come from these countries. Um, but we also do see uh, escorts uh, and sex workers from Australia, from the UK, from Europe, America, so on and so forth. But they generally are of a slightly more privileged position in that they are never suspected of doing sex work or escort work in Singapore. So it's often the young ASEAN women who get profiled as sex workers or they'll be stopped at borders, so on and so forth. Um, so language is a barrier, so it's very hard for us to reach out to um, uh, uh, as many sex workers as possible. So, but we try, we have networks all over the world. We are part of a various uh, global sex worker projects sort of organization so that we can try to spread our information from the source countries um, itself. Uh, okay, so that's roughly the work that we do. Actually, one thing I was hoping to uh, move on to is a lot of times sex workers come to us and they say the sex education 
um, in Singapore is rubbish. Okay, so we do work with Singaporean sex workers also. Um, and, and a lot of times the clients come to them with very basic questions that, uh, uh, or do not know how to express their desires in a respectful manner. Right, so that's when um, a lot of boundaries can be crossed, a lot of unpleasantries, and sometimes even violence can happen. Right? Um, so one thing that a lot of sex workers demand is that our sex education teaches us how to firstly uh, explore our own sexuality. What do we enjoy? What do we not enjoy? And then how do we express that to our sex partner? Uh, and finally, how to negotiate uh, boundaries and, and, and all these kinds of stuff. So, yeah. Even sex workers, yeah, sex workers feel that there's not enough sex education in Singapore. Um, well, in terms of you know knowing how you feel about yourself, um, Martha, you as a sex uh, counselor, how do you approach that conversation with your clients? Like, do they? Where do you start with in terms of advising them where to start finding out what they like and what they don't like about sex? That's possible. The, the first thing is, uh, if you want to learn, uh, <laughs> this is a bit deja vu because I had an interview this morning on the same thing. Uh, so, yes, so I, I, didn't, I didn't know when I was training to be a sexologist that I talk so much about masturbation. And uh, that's what I do. I, um, with my inhibited clients, I, I teach them, uh, explain to them the importance of self-pleasuring so that they can first understand their own bodies and then they can communicate this to their partners. And a lot of them are not really interested in their own bodies. They just want to be able to have sex. They want to give to their partners and please their partners. So uh, pleasure to them is not necessary. And uh, some of them have never had an orgasm, never masturbated. So I, I have to explain to them that a lot of uh, men are givers and uh, they, would, uh, they would be quite unhappy if they give but their partner doesn't know what to say and doesn't know how to uh, respond and that's a, that's a source of frustration for, uh, uh, for them. And uh, so it starts from something as simple as anatomy and uh, something as simple as encouraging them uh, maybe even using a sex toy if they feel really uncomfortable. So this element of shame around our sexuality, I think it's uh, common even for people who don't come from religious or oppressive backgrounds because uh, masturbation is something that we do in private, in, uh, somehow in secret and uh, behind closed doors. So because of that, there's always that element of um, perceived, um, I shouldn't be doing this kind of a thing. So the normalization around masturbation I feel is very important and which is why I, I talk a lot about it and uh, have YouTube videos and book about masturbation. And uh, yeah, does that answer your question? Um, I think maybe to the rest of the panelists as well then, when you look at, so within your in various industries and you know, the businesses that you work for, what would you want to see more of in terms of the conversation? What do you think um, how do you think that it could be improved? Like, I mean, we always want to, we always talk about, <laughs> there you go, but we always talk about solutions, right? So beyond the healthcare community as well, right? What should, um, hypothetically, if the HPB came to you, if Red Mart, which is already working with you, or a more conservative organization came to the both of you and said, how do we start to run content marketing campaigns or engage with sex workers in a different way or teach young, young kids on the sex industry and how to respect it. What, you know, what is it that you want to hear or see? So we'll start with whomever. Okay, so I, I became a sexologist because I wanted to help people have uh, better sex and I see sex as an important part of a relationship. I did not know that I would just keep working with people with problems. And uh, so that's why I do my workshops, because my workshops are interesting and fun, which you should attend. Um, and and uh, I feel that my, and through my workshops, it's more proactive rather than reactive. 
rather than seeing those people who are on the verge of divorce because they have been having sexual problems for years and years, I rather have a more proactive approach. So what is missing in Singapore uh, and has been missing, I've been doing this almost 10 years, has still been missing is uh, talking about sex in positive ways. So that's, that's why I became a sexologist because I got angry with only reading about sex in negative ways, uh, uh, anti-abortion or anti-STI rates or be careful of this, be careful of that. And it's only when I became a sex expert that I get all these opportunities to be interviewed by the media that I realized that the media, their hands are also tied. They have to talk about sex in a moralistic way. You do this and then you're going to get pregnant. You do this and you're going to get an STI. So there's no like, just talk about sex for the sake of talking about sex and just talk about sex in the form of pleasure. And so I got fed up with it and so that's why I started to make my own videos and uh, launch my own masturbation month campaign uh, online uh, and uh, write my own books and uh, self-publish my books because nobody would publish them. And um, uh, so yeah, I feel that this is very much missing. So it's, it's, it's missing because nobody would, would, would uh, have the outlet to do it. And so then I do it. Okay, so if Health Promotion Board came to me, which they did this year, um, I told them um, that they really need to be talking about uh, sex in terms of sexual skills because that's what people want to learn and that's what people will listen. But no. <laughs> um, I think uh, it, it, I also haven't shown the products, but um, what we try to do is, is make um, the topic of sex very approachable. So our, our, I'm, I'll answer the question. It's a roundabout way. Um, so. Uh, our main demographic is, is women who are vicarious, or women who are curious to own a vibrator but do not currently own one. And we found that there's a large market for that, but also they were you know, turned off by the uh, products. Again, they look very phallic and, and intimidating. And because they are intimidated uh, by that kind of industry or the products, then they don't also access that knowledge um, because they feel like it's kind of outside their, their reach. So we wanted to create products that can be talked about, can be uh, you know, touched or accessed a bit more um, easily in everyday environments. But I think also it's important to focus on not just like the orgasm alone and how, you know, the, the climax, but also just the journey and how you can also attain pleasure through various means. So, so one of our products is the Fireman. So it's, it's a pretty cutesy name. Um, but it looks like a little flame and it's supposed to be for like clitoral stimulation. Um, and again, it, it looks like this. So you use this on the clitoris like so. Um, it's pretty cute. And then what we want to also say with this product is that it's not necessarily just for the orgasm alone. It's not like other products out there, like the womanizer or whatever, that you'll get an orgasm in like five seconds because that's like, then you're just like, oh, okay, I got it, I'm done. Um, but we wanted to, for people to understand the journey. And so this, you know, you can use this massager for minutes, hours, who knows. Um, and th that, should be, that should be the goal, right? Just like getting pleasure. It doesn't necessarily have to be for any kind of like, climax any kind of really goal, but just the pleasure, the pure joy of it, I guess. Um, and so that's what we try to do, and I think that there should be more, more education and information around that. That's not just a one, one goal thing, but it's, it's a whole process, I guess. Yeah, I just want to echo on what you've just said, because um, I, I, I guess in marketing in general here in Singapore, or in by and large, is that we, we, we need to have a KPI, right? You need to have a KPI to make a campaign, right? You need to, oh, how many th things I need to sell? Oh, this thing is, hap uh, the government will tell you something like, oh, there is STDs rising. We need to make a campaign about STDs and like, let's do like something cute and fun so that like when you're like a 70 year old auntie walking down the street, you still kind of like am okay with the graphics and the visuals and not like flip over with your NTUC bags. So, we, we always need to make sure that everything is palatable for everyone, especially here. So um, um, I think the, the bigger conversation is how actually um, we can change how marketing looks in, in Singapore. Instead of us always looking at a KPI, a specific KPI for something, let's say you want to talk about a certain service. So I'm working with um, a certain company now talking about a, a service for women and for the vulvas and how uh, they can feel better about um, 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 reinvigorating their, 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 their intimate areas. And, and, and they wanted to hit a KPI, we need a lot of sign-ups, we need a lot of people to come and buy this product. But instead of that, the picture for a lot of these campaigns, it doesn't need to be about sex in general, like it could be a chair or it could be a, a, a tech product here in Singapore. It should come from a premise of 
the, the full picture, like you said, the process. So when you look at product, you need to look at the brand, you need to look at the story, you need to look at what you're talking about. And in terms of the government and sex, we're not just looking at, oh, there are a bunch of STDs on the rise, let's do a campaign about the STDs. But why are there STDs on the rise? Is that because, let's do some research, is it because people don't know how to protect themselves? And why? Is it because they're rushing into it? And why? Is it because they're watching porn and like, expecting it to be done unprotected? And why? So we keep asking ourselves why, we'll hit to a point where we really realize what's the real goal. And when you realize, or when, when the government realized that actually it's all about education, which is actually the number one thing that Asia needs, it's education. It's, we can't say, hey man, like, oh my God, let me pleasure you, you pleasure me. We can't do things like that. We have to say, like, the end goal is to make sure for us to lower down STDs, for example, or for, for a higher reproduction rate. Let's take all these whys, take all the step backs, and then realize, hey, actually, it all just comes down to my personal pleasure, how I can personally pleasure myself and my partner, and have that conversation and normalize that to, to create a, a better uh, understanding for that. So do you think it's almost kind of like, and we'll go back to you guys after this as well, but it's almost like a return to traditional Asian values in a way, because it's all about the end goal, right? It's about you must get the house, you must get married, you must get a university degree, you must go to the right school. It's all about the climax, right? It's yeah. about getting to that point. It's not Unintended. about just getting through the journey to understand who you are, what do you actually love, what do you want to do? What's your passion? So is that, how do you think that, you know, to all of you, how do you think that we can actually do that? If you look at the, at the system right now, is there any way that people here could even be starting a conversation? Or are there groups that they could be working with? Or is there a way for them to, you know, to even influence people? Like something like Pink Dot didn't come out of nowhere. It came about because there was a group of people who wanted to change the conversation. So if we wanted to do something like that, what happens? Just have to think about it a little bit. So a lot of uh, times when it comes to sexuality, the way we, we look at it is quite a masculine approach. So when I say masculine, I mean the approach, which is uh, very direct, very straightforward, task-oriented, goal-oriented. Uh, that's why are we doing this if there's no orgasm or ejaculation? Why are we even bothering? So. Uh, this is why um, uh, different messages need to come out, uh, like what Jacqueline is saying, a more feminine approach, which is, uh, uh, you know, a feminine approach is, is uh, I know some people, the moment I say feminine, they think I'm talking about women, no. Uh, that there's a masculine and feminine qualities in both men and women. I'm talking about a softer approach, a more indirect approach to sexuality that you're not so goal-oriented. But what I've found is that uh, it doesn't matter what I say to... Uh, person with a penis, uh, they are still going to be very masculine in their approach to sex. They are going to always be thinking about sex uh, in terms of the masculine approach. And so what I found is the reason why they are fixated with uh, the masculine approach to sex is because their sexuality is very much penis-centric. Whether it can stand, whether it can shoot. And so what I do is I teach them skills. So once you know what you're doing and you know how to do it and you know how exactly to manage or control your sexuality in the form of sexual confidence, this is when you are actually open to what else is there? That's when people are, I feel, open to uh, play, playfulness and fun and being less goal-oriented. It's only when you know what you're doing that you actually feel that you are open to more things. So this is why uh, a lot of people are still very goal-oriented, whether it's men or women. So the women who are coming to me who are tired and exhausted, not wanting to have sex, uh, low sex drive, uh, not having orgasms, when I ask them, what do you think you should do? Every single one of them I've asked said, I don't know, I think I need to buy a sex toy. So still their approach is very masculine, which is, I just need to try harder. I need to be a good girl and try harder. If I try harder, I will come. That's sad, that's sad. Uh, <clears throat> I, I guess for like Asian culture, uh, sex education is uh, kind of a taboo subject, right? I mean like every school will have a, a sex education, but it's mostly or oriented about like uh, uh, reproduction. But the thing is when government or like all these uh, institutions didn't want to talk uh, sex in a positive way, in a reality way, a lot of people will go to porn, right? So to be honest, like now is porn is like the default sex education for even younger younger people. 
So there's a research like the youngest people now that watch porn, it starts from like 12 years old or e even 11 years old, which is getting quite worried. And the thing is like, I'm not saying that porn is bad, but people just need to know like, what is, the, uh, what is porn actually? Porn is actually is entertainment. It's like a movie, something that you watch, it, it entertain yourself, but it's nothing to do with documentary. It's nothing to do with education. Because like all this porn is mostly uh, driven by like uh, for man's pleasure. So that's why like we always have this gap where a lot of women did not have an orgasm even like when they're having sex because like for the guy's mind is like, oh, this is how you do it, right? And, and in, uh, for women also like, oh, this is how you do it. Basically like you have to like accept whatever the guy's doing to you. Uh, yeah, people just need to know like when uh, this porn was, I, I, I managed to like talk to a few people who are in the porn industry. I was like, oh wow, how, what do you do? Like, how do you do the porn movie? So porn is actually, a lot of the porn movie actually, it was shot in a few scene, right? So it was taken like in a few days, right? But, but in, when you watch it, a lot of people always think like, oh, this is real. It's, this guy has a, like a strong stamina, like it lasts for half an hour, like 45 minutes, right? So when the normal guys only last like, 10 minutes is like, oh, I'm not that good, right? So like, no guys will ever say like, oh, I only last five minutes. But the fact is that the typical average for men is only five minutes, right? So you don't have to be shy about it, right? So, <clears throat> but the point is always give you like a wrong expectation about like sexuality and then, uh, yeah, so, so it's just give a, a wrong expectation. So what I'm trying to say is that porn is just an entertainment, it's nothing to do with education. Uh. Yeah. I'll just keep it short, so, so we can have everybody represented uh, as well. Um, so, uh, thanks for bringing Ping Dot up. I think um, um, it, it, it's close to home. Uh, and how Ping Dot come about, came about is really, you, you get, everybody understands that sexuality or sexual identity is something that we don't really talk about, or anything about sex or about um, identities. So, um, if we take that lens of how Ping Dot came about, we realize that uh, unlike like, like Mardi Gras or like, like the US with like gay pride and all that, which is a really an extroverted way of seeing things, you realize introversion is very much celebrated here. So that's why like Ping Dot had to take on the form of introversion and education to sort of start echoing a chamber to create a bigger audience. And I think there's a lot to learn from that it's, as a campaign, whether it's close or not, it's, it's, it's you realizing that when you're talking to somebody about sexual wellness and whether it's woman to woman, man to man, man to woman, woman to man, let's, let's talk about it. You have to come from, a, we, ha we have to come from a point that is uh, sensitive, introspective, educational, and, and, and package in a way that is palatable for everyone. So, I mean, I would employ everybody to say, like, like talking to your girlfriends, how's your, how's, your, uh, how's your personal wellness going? Like, that, that's an easy way to start. Like, uh, are you drinking our water? Hey, you've been doing yoga classes with me. That's a really good yoga teacher. And, and by the way, like, you know, um, 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 how, uh, how's, how's everything else? Are, are you getting enough sleep? Uh, uh, who are you dating now? Who are you seeing? What's happening? And then start to open a conversation from there onwards. So you become a lot more holistic in views. So I think the, to your question, like, like how we can start a movement, we might have to package it in a way that is bigger than just sex. It might have to come from a place of personal wellness. It might have to be, uh, let's talk about your health, your fitness, blah, blah, and their sex. And I have a friend who's trying to do that with, um, um, in Fort Canning. So I think she's starting an event that talks about all this as a personal wellness and sex and LGBT issues will be part of that. But more importantly, when, when we, we position it well enough, people will see it and people will start to echo and normalize a lot of these um, 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 things that right now we, we're not open to talk about right now. Yeah. So I, I, I wanted to highlight one thing uh, about, uh, we talked about sexuality education and HPB and everything. One thing that needs to be spelled out is that the HPB's policy right now is abstinence. It is still the policy of HPB for schools to teach abstinence. Um, and they're not going to change that until um, there is a consolidated, well, maybe not consolidated, a, a serious movement for them to stop it. I think they're still preaching the ABCD thing. I don't remember what BCD means. I a, B, C, D, abstinence, and then? Uh, <laughs> no condom, cannot use condom, abstinence. 
Okay, I forgot. Okay, you can check it out on, on the Health Promotion Board and the Ministry of Education's website where they talk about sexuality, uh, sex education in schools. And um, he, here's more icing on the cake. Uh, I have a few teachers who were Ministry of Education teachers. Uh, and, and in order to become a sex educator, uh, sexuality education teacher in school, you have to pass a test. And obviously, this test would ask you questions like, are you married? Do you have children? Are you religious? Um, what are your beliefs about sex? Um, we don't know what the right answers are, but we can only guess what the right answers are. So I have a friend, she's very, um, she's very sex positive, uh, and she wanted to be a sex education teacher, but she was rejected. Okay, so, uh, and, and it's usually... Yeah, anyway, um, so I think one thing that maybe people, we can do is, I mean, if you have children, if you have nieces, nephews who go to schools in Singapore, um, Talk to, to them, right? What was your sex education like? Uh, uh, what did they teach you in schools? Um, and maybe just write in a letter to the school and be like, hey, I think your sex education sucks. Um, or maybe in a nicer way. I think one thing about the whole extroversion, introversion thing is uh, I, I, in activism, there is um, a, a start to move away from calling out. Right? So sometimes when people make like a racist, homophobic, sexist remark, we'd be like, hey, you! You are sexist, you are a bigot, blah, 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 blah. Um, and people are starting to, to, to move away from calling out to calling in, right? And what that means is maybe we need to start having a conversation, no matter how hard and no matter how much energy will drain from you, to be like, hey, can we have a, have a quick chat? You know, just now those words that you use, uh, not that great, you know, you, must, you can try using this term or that term. Um, and, and that can foster, can open up conversations around a topic rather than shouting at people, um, which I like to do. I, I will admit, I do like to do that. Um, uh, sometimes I, get, I have anger management problems. Um, yeah, I wanted to make one last point, which uh, hopefully links everything uh, together about shame and sexuality, but also one more thing, which is gender roles, which we haven't really touched on. Um, there are still very prominent uh, expectations of men and women in society, in Singapore society. Uh, and it's very obvious when you are working within the sex industry. Uh, men, well, the male people that I've met tend to come with a very split uh, 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 expectations of women. On the one hand, they want women to be super sexy, C cups, small waist, uh, sexually like very uh, ravenous. And then on the other hand, they're looking for a wife, somebody who would bear them many, many children that can sort of carry on the, the, the family name and so on and so forth. Uh, it sounds very outdated, but, but it is still uh, very common to hear these sentiments um, when I talk to, to men who patronize sex workers. Um, and, and they range from all ages, right? You would think that those are the men who are like in their 40s and their 50s, but that's not true. I've met younger men, 20s, 30s, who also think that way. Um, and, and that's why there is a demand for the sex industry in, in one aspect, right? Um, sex workers come to me and say like, all oh, these men, they're married, you know, but they have all these sexual appetite that they don't dare to express to their wives or they don't expect their wives to do um, those crazy things that they want to do. So it can be fetish work, right? We, we, a lot of people go to sex workers for fetish work, for BDSM work, um, for fantasy works, right? And, and and these are conversations that these men are not comfortable to have with their wives because they have desexualized their wives. They see them as just baby-making machine. So we, we need to be able to allow women um, to speak up about their sexual desires and, and, and that, uh, their need to have orgasms or, or just other forms of pleasure, right? It's not be all and all orgasm. Um, yeah, for me, gender roles is also one thing that needs to be smashed. Any questions? Oh, okay, there you go. So just continuing on sex and shame, so especially in Asia, a lot of the problem is also with families. We're talking about education and talking about talking to your nieces and nephews and you know, friends' children and things like that, but where is the conversation around here sex education in school go home and talk to your parents about that because a lot of the shame a lot of i think the overcompensation that happens outside of the house is because it's a taboo 
subject in the home. It's a taboo subject with the people that raise you, that teach you your values, that teach you, oh, you know, Asians behave like this. This is our tradition. You make babies, follow all these values that we teach you at home. So how can we extend the education to something that, you know, children take back, children feel free and open to talk to their families and other adults who know what sex is about um, and not just rely on sex education or then porn, right? So it's either entertainment or education that is very contrived in a certain way and so... Uh, it's just, yeah, I think that's a tricky question, obviously. Um, but, uh, so what we've done for the company is in, we want it to be sold only in everyday retail environments so you can spark a conversation. And that conversation can start with anyone, right? It can involve children. Um, there has actually been, there was one complaint once in a Mothership article about how these products, you know, our, our, our vibrators on display are so close to children's toys or, or, or things like that. Um, and I, I don't think that's necessarily a valid complaint because even if it's with next to children's toys, like, you know, they don't know the better. Like, they'll just ask, what is that? And that can start a conversation, but then it's up to the adults not to have that shame as well, right? So I think um, for us to act, to educate children is difficult. I mean, if you, if you have, you know, ways to do that, but to educate the adults and make sure that they're not, you know, ashamed to talk about these topics, ashamed of their own sexuality, men and, and women, and so that they can start a conversation with their, their children. Um, yeah, I think it's harder to, to talk about the children. I know from my upbringing, I'm American, but my parents are from Indonesia, and I'm very vocal about everything, and so I force them to have that conversation. But it's, again, a very tricky thing to do. Um, but I think you just have to be, you know, unashamed of, of these topics um, and understanding that what we're doing also as, as like, educators or, you know, marketing professionals or, yeah, um, brand owners is, is trying to educate. And also making sure that people, whether it be, you know, conservative, you know, minorities or, or, or bodies to like liberal uh, bodies to understand that what we're just trying to do is make sure that people have the right education and, and information. We're not trying to, you know, promote unplanned pregnancies or trying to promote, you know, extramarital affairs, just information. And it's only through this information that people can make the right choices. Um, so I think that's what we're trying to do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh I don't know whether I want to say this being, uh, it sounds really dismal or what, but like it's really a generation kind of like uh, consensus, right? Like if we look at our parents and how they approached us to talk about sex or identity in general, they don't talk about it. What, what they want to talk about is performance, right? How you are as a person, like where's your grades? Is it A plus? Is it, is it uh, if not, don't come talk to me. So we, we are so driven by performance, we, we find it shameful to it is a conversation that the next generation should take on, which is how our children and, um, and how our, and our um, like I say, nieces and nephews, where they grow up, it needs to be from an angle that, that is where sex is normalized or the education of it is normalized. We're not saying that a generation before us is like, ah, it's screwed, that's it, but, but, we, but we, let's just look at the future and how we can approach from there. I think one interesting, different perspectives to this, so one interesting way is to actually um, get parents involved in the conversation of being a, a collaborator in sex education with teachers in education. So um, maybe there's a way, there's a way we can talk to the government, there's a way we can approach to say, instead of us always relying on chapter six of my biology textbook in sec three and four, I still remember, that's, that's legit by the way. It's really chapter six. Um, it, it <laughs> I don't know why, I, don't know. Yeah. I came from a boys' school, so chapter 6 was amazing, <laughs> apparently. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, so, so instead of us being so precise about that, like, could it be like, can, um, can we run a campaign that says like, hey, uh, parents, um, why not tell your, teacher, tell your children how you, they were made, you know? Like, like, you know, open up, maybe ask children to, to talk to their parents like, uh, mom and dad, how was I made? Like, that's a really, really nice, holistic way to approach a subject because you are creating life from love that came from sex. But it's how we want to position it and whether um, the, the officials in, in government bodies are ready for that question. When they see 
um, um, the trends and, 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 and where conversations are going that belongs to a younger generation and see statistics from there, they will understand that the communications devices that we use need to change. And when we change it to become more holistic for, for that target audience, whether it's like, like what I just said, that's just an idea. It's nothing. It's just an ad creative trying to pitch your ideas. But if there are many other ways to do it, so, so we should, like in, in our daily basis, just make it normal to talk about sex, you know? Like, how's your wellness? How's everything? And then seeing like stuff like great, beautiful sex toys in pharmacies, great way. Let's, let's find ways where we can normalize the topic. Wear a shirt that, that, that talks about that, maybe has a really abstract looking vagina. I, I'm all for that. Like, I, I'm, I'm, like, I'm, I'm not trying to be controversial but trying to find means and ways in our own daily lives to reach out to our, our friends and our families with that, yeah. Can I just say, sorry, like, um, me and my mom, we don't really talk very much. Um, one day I found her vibrator when I was searching through the cupboards. And I was like, what is this, you know? And ever since then, I can talk to her about anything. I started talking to her about my relationships, I started talking to her about the guys that I've been seeing, and if I'm not home, she knows where, like, well, she doesn't know where I am, but she knows that I'm out doing stuff. <laughs> but, but yeah, so maybe, you know, just leave some toys lying around for people to pick up. Saying. Next question. Um, I just wanted to uh, address your question because I'm a teacher. So I teach in international school, I teach biology, and I also run the sex ed oh. program, which took me three years to sort out. They finally let me do it. Um, but one of the ways we sort of introduce this with students, um, so we work with kids from 14 to 18, is this idea of what they want from a relationship. So you don't have to talk straight away about the sex. It's really what's a healthy relationship and what do they expect, and then relating that to sexuality and sexual preferences. Um, and the other thing we talk about is guilt. And we don't relate that directly to sex again from the start. And we talk about, you know, just like Asian parents making you feel guilty about getting straight A's, right? And that's a huge thing our kids face. And then you can link that again, and that's the way we do it. Uh, my mom doesn't know what I'm doing. I mean, like, what she knows is that I'm just working on an app. I mean, my parents didn't know what I'm doing. Um, my sister kind of know what I'm doing. Uh, she only says, like, keep going for it. But we never talk about this word, orgasm. <laughs> So yeah, it's, it's, it's tough. It's, it's, it's a tough question, but I, I guess it's all. A lot of parents will expect uh, all this sex education from, come from the school, and yeah, we still have a big, big hope from the school to teach uh, the education to to the kids. Yeah. So this is like a weird, not a weird, but a different kind of perspective. So um, my mom goes to church twice a day. The woman's retired, but she really, 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 really loves going to church. Like she's all about church, which is great. Um, but I was telling her about, um, I wear a lanyard for Accenture, which is the LGBT ally program. Um, and when a couple of people saw me posting about it, they immediately asked me, oh, are you a lesbian? Um, the fact that I used to date girls when I was in university was, it's, it was a part of life, but you know, that, that's what it is. But it was who, how my mom reacted, because when I told her about this person asking me that question, she was just like, it doesn't make sense why people don't understand that it's just important that everyone has the same um, abilities to hit success or be themselves and more importantly, be happy. So this is a, when, we, when I was growing up, I was always very liberal. She was always very conservative. And she always used to ask me about why I was interested in a more liberal lifestyle. Why was it that I was reading Jack Kerouac? What was it about all of these writers that I was really interested in? Tell me about Stanley Kubrick. Everything, poetry especially. So we used to have these sessions and most recently a very old friend of ours, um, her son, um, who's a good friend of mine, came out gay. Um, my mom and this woman go to church together and she kicked him out of the house. Um, and he wasn't allowed to come back in. The only person that was actually able to make some sense into um, this woman was my mom. So she actually went and had the conversation with his mother um, and said, it's the most important thing in your life is to know that you've raised a child who is happy, passionate, and actually being able to be themselves. What if he may drive the Porsche, but if he's unhappy and miserable in a loveless marriage, there is no point. So, 
I feel like when it comes to education, it's not just a one-way thing. It's not me as an adult to a younger person, but sometimes I feel with the older generation, we need to make an effort to actually explain to them where we're coming from because they didn't see it. What they saw was you marry someone in Singapore or the town that you're from or the village that you're from. Now it's the world is a completely different place and we have the ability to influence them to think about what the world in a different way. It might be music, it might be movies, it might be campaigns which are super interesting, it might be showing them a little different part of life, um, whatever it might be. So, I mean, I think back to your question, the one thing it's got to do with age, I think it's just about being able to be, have an open conversation with the people around you from here versus like what is the right thing to do, which is what just seems to always be, you know, heading home when we look in Singapore or Southeast Asia or anywhere for that matter, right? But yeah, that's my story. Anyway, yes. So sort of tangentially from that, um, I'm really sort of curious and I guess personally invested in elderly sex or elders, older people sex. Um, and I was wondering what, if anyone could talk about, I guess, what sort of campaigns there are regarding older people sex. Um, if there's any sort of design or directed towards that. Um, if during advocacy or as a sexologist, you talk to older people, like how does that differ from this focus on educating the younger generation? And how do we sustain this idea of pleasure and um, I guess rela re relationality all the way through to our older age? Yeah, so, so I, um, I, I speak, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm very um, honored and I'm very grateful that I get to speak in medical conferences. Just came back last weekend from the in, uh, Malaysian International ONG Conference. So I, I gave a presentation on sex after 50 for women. And I have also given presentations on sex um, after menopause. And uh, yes, uh, there are hormonal changes which can cause uh, vaginal dryness and also vaginal thinning but uh, the situation does stabilize over time and there are people who report after menopause that actually sex is better because they are no longer worried about their kids and they're not no longer worried about being pregnant. So I think it's just a, uh, like a, a transition phase. But what happens with a lot of people with the lack of sex education, when there's pain, when there's difficulty, is they stop having sex. And so it's very important when you're going through that transition to actually not stop. But if we don't have that knowledge, we stop. And also we don't have many uh, role models of uh, positive sexuality for women who are older. And actually this is also probably one of the reasons why Hollywood is now showing older actors and actresses. And it's very important because we get to see the modeling of positive sexuality in the media. Uh, whereas 10 years ago, um, I, I got all this knowledge, but really there wasn't these kind of images. And now there is some. So it's important that if we are not getting this from our parents, that we find the answers for ourselves. And uh, it is entirely possible to have sex, uh, regardless of what gender, nationality, race, or sexual orientation. It's possible for you to have sex until the day you die. There are even people who talk about orgasmic death. They talk about orgasmic birth. You can have an orgasmic death. So you can, uh, you know, masturbate to, your, uh, masturbate to your death. You can. Um, I can't, I don't know how to follow up with that. <laughs> um, but, so, we do also work with the older community um, as well. Um, so, for instance, we found, just talking about, first when we like, did our research into, again, this industry, we found that while condom usage decreases with age, the use of vibrators and lubricants increases with age. Um, and that's not just, you know, lubricants just for actual, uh, you know, spicing up purposes, but also for necessity. Um, so in Malaysia, we also work with a lot of stroke um, or spinal cord injury patients. And, and we help validate sexuality and show how important it is to reintroduce intimacy into their lives. And so just try and, I think, so I think maybe from a younger perspective, it could be uh, from our perspective from our learnings. A younger demographic will f want to see sex as just for, for pleasure and just like, oh, it's just for fun, whatever. But what we try to reiterate to the older generation is how important it, it really is and how it is an essential component of their general well-being. 
right? There are like linkages between sexual health to physical well-being, to emotional uh, health. And so that's what we try to re uh, emphasize to them. And so we can use the vibrators with spinal cord injury um, patients to, you know, they get more, they have a, a lower tolerance of like, lower sensitivity to these things, so they have to use vibrators and stuff. And even when I'm doing my workshops with nurses in, in uh, rural places, uh, I have to tell them that, of course, you know, women who, uh, after menopause will be a bit more dry, so they will need lubrication. Or, or women who've undergone chemotherapy also require that. And this is something that they're actually not aware of. Like, they don't understand why um, these, these patients might require such products, be it vibrators or lubricants. And we have the backing, you know, of, of different sexologists, gynecologists to, to back that up. But we just have to, to tell them these things and show them that it is important that they take care of their sexual health. Um, so I think it, it, it's slightly the same infor information, um, but just maybe talking about it in terms of their general well-being than just just pleasure, uh, period. Yeah. Hey, I'm uh, Pradeep. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur and I'm um, trying to build a company. And just two days back, I got some idea around uh, erectile dysfun dysfunctionality. Basically, uh, what happens if you are engaged with the smartphone too much, you know, throughout your day, it builds on long, in long term, it leads to stress and anxiety and maybe some kind of depression. And then it also impacts on the you know, sexual life. So, I'm, first of all, I'm very happy to see such an event happening where people can talk about anything related to sex so openly. I mean, I've tried my best to talk to people, but people just, you know, uh, aloof themselves. So, it's very sensitive topic. So, and this problem which I'm uh, talking about, uh, I just wanted to know, like, I've done some research around this, but people say that... Uh, you know, 10% of people who are surveyed, uh, they check their smartphone while having sex. I mean, just imagine... Uh, yeah, that's conservative number, but it's, it might be high. So imagine the smartphone playing the role in your life, especially sexual life, which is the most pleasurable thing in the world. So that's one uh, question I just wanted to ask, like, if you have, I mean, if you have come across some men or, you know, you yourself do it, I mean, I just wanted a survey kind of thing one on the, around this. Second question I have with the vib vibrator thing. Let's say a woman starts using a vibrator. What if she, her minimum expectation is now raised? And now men cannot actually, you know. <laughs> I mean, so this is a, you know, it can be a industry which can be, you know, if I'm a government agency, I can just say stop using it because, you know, it's playing with the emotions. I, the, minimum, I, the minimum expectations has been okay. raised, so women now expect that I can only have with the... Yeah. I, I, I can't respond to the first part about the smartphones. Yeah, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. Um, but but uh, <laughs> when we're selling our products, especially on, offline, like at different marketplace events, right, we'll have women and, and men join. Oftentimes in a, in a relationship, the couples come, and the men are like, yeah, will that replace me? Or, uh, you know, what if, she, or we've even heard, like, will she get addicted to that? That's actually a query we've gotten from both men and women. But I, I, I don't think, again, our, our products, but even just general sexual well-being products in general, I mean, they're, they can be used for masturbation, but it's also meant to sub supplement their, their uh, normal sexual uh, relationships. So it's not meant to be a replacement. I, I don't no. think any of no. our products are... Like the way pornography started, right? Maybe, I don't know when did it start, but... It is now being said that you don't uh, use pornography as a standard to, you know, learn or uh, play, a, play upon. I see, I mean, there is one drawback it might come in, maybe not now, maybe in 10, 20 years, that when women don't get pleasure through, from men, but they start going for uh, vibrators and then the relationships are... No, I think, so, um, uh, I, uh, I, I'll say really quick, I'll say it. Um, I think that, again, our, our vibrators are meant to be as a complement and, and to help couples. And, and if they are being unsatisfied in their relationship, men or women, if they're being unsatisfied, then it just um, is necessary for them to communicate what, it, what is the, the issue, right? It's like, so you, you seem to be saying like also that vaginal penetration or like the penis is the most important thing, but only like 10% of women actually are stimulated by that. Really like the other 80 to 90% of women are stimulated by other forms of, of pleasure. Um, so there are other ways to enhance their sexual relationship other than, you know, just that kind of penetration. I, I'm just saying that 
Again, products are meant to enhance their relationships, not meant to be a replacement, I think, for us. Really love the question. Uh, I, I got a lot of guys' friends uh, having the same question. Like, am I creating a product that's going to replace men, especially with uh, all the technology? So my question to them is always like, do you really love your wife, right? Do you want to satisfy her? Because to be honest, like, you don't need a vibrator to satisfy a woman if you know where to uh, stimulate it. The thing is, like, you have to do this at least 15 minutes to 20 minutes, right? So, to be honest, that can be quite tiring. I mean, if you're in the beginning of your relationship, half an hour is fine, right? But if you are, after you get married, like, if you have to do foreplay 20 minutes, 30 minutes, that is a lot of hard work. I mean, like, you can use your hand, you can use your mouth, but a lot of my friends say, like, yeah, I couldn't do that, right? So I told him, like, the, the product that we do is like, it's really small. It's not going to compete with what you have, right? That's the first thing. That's why like we designed it very small. And then, uh, so once you're done, right, you just have to be aware that your wife also needs an orgasm, right? Which is like, you can use a tool. Just see this as a tool, right? So if you can do it manually, that is the best, right? I mean, all women love like oral sex, right? But can you do that every day, 20 minutes down there? <laughs> so my, I, I guess my take is that uh, vibrator is just a tool. It's not to replace a man. Women still need the love, I mean, like the connection, the intimacy from, from guys. Yeah. Yeah, all people. Yeah. Okay, question one. Uh, will there be dependency on sex app or porn, right? Question one. Smartphone. Smartphone. Okay, I get what you're trying to say. We are using the phone all the time. We get stressed, we get anxious. And how does this affect our lives? Um, there are also people who use their phone to watch porn. Again, the uh, dependency on electronic devices. So if you realize that you are doing it and it's not working for you, or you need to be watching porn while having sex, or you need to be on your phone while you're having sex, then uh, maybe your partner is not so happy about it. Then you can choose to do differently. If your partner is okay with it, then continue by all means, that's not a problem. It's not a problem until it's a problem. So it, it sounds like for you, it seems like a problem. So uh, what you need to be doing is stop doing it. Just stop. Uh, so how you stop is maybe uh, you, you uh, vary the way you are using your electronic devices. I think this is the reason why people go on detox uh, or treatment camps. Uh, there are such things. Uh, so that's, that's uh, 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 but seriously, actually, uh, there are other ways to um, be more uh, in control of your mind, such as meditation, such as uh, mindful masturbation, rather than always relying on porn. So I actually work with clients to, uh, uh, you know, they, they feel that they are desensitized, you know, uh, porn, okay, big tits, what else? Let's go to the next new thing. And so they start to feel that within themselves, they are kind of a bit burnt out or jaded about sex. So the resensitization process involves uh, doing less, doing less. So there will be a time where you feel a bit displaced and disorientated, like, what am I doing? I'm not getting what the kind of oomph that I used to get. Uh, it's just a matter of getting used to less. So uh, uh, question number two, will there be a dependency to sex toys? Yes, there are some women who actually use very, very strong vibrators, but look at what they have. It's small, okay? So they're not going to be addicted to it, okay? It's not like sugar. It's, it's small. So what's happening with smaller vibrators is they also tend to have uh, weaker motors. And uh, so... Uh, uh, yeah, it can be strong, it can be strong. But what I'm trying to say is when you use a vibrator to the point of pain, that obviously is not working. So you need to learn how to listen to your body so that you vary not just the, the use of the vibrator, uh, and uh, you can also try to, if you feel that you are developing a dependency to the uh, vibrator, which happens to some of my clients, um, then what you can do is you uh, train yourself to resensitize your body, uh, um, meaning uh, learn how to masturbate in different ways, whether you are a man or a woman. So same thing for men who have a dependency to porn, learn how to masturbate in different ways. Uh, for women who are dependent on their vibrator, uh, I would say get different vibrators and uh, masturbate in different ways and uh, be creative, be gentle with yourself, not be rough and aggressive with yourself all the time. And uh, no, it's not true that uh, when you enjoy something a lot, you will keep wanting to do it. Yes, we do. But you, you just keep doing it until you get sick of it and then maybe you want to do something else. 
Sorry, can I just say something really quickly? I know maybe it's not going to help Owen, but I just want to say like, we are all really just carnal creatures, really, right? And the whole reason, uh, I mean, I think what you're trying to say is also is alluding to a, a world that's like Westworld, you know, like whether, we'll, hey, we're going to be replaced by like all these like beautiful people that we can just like, like, like hump and like get humped there and then, and then stay on our story. But really, like ultimately sex, the reason for it, um, yes, reproduction, but it's connection, right? It really is connection. So I think a lot of times when it comes down to like even like um, why we have extramarital affairs or stuff like that or why we want to explore, it really is because we feel ashamed to not have that connection with somebody or, like, or, or we don't want to talk about fully like what kind of relationship we're expecting with the other person. And it takes many ways and forms. It's, it's a complex process. Some monogamous, polygamous, we, there's so many camps about sex, relationships, connections. But what, what, what's most important is that at the end of the day, are you able to communicate with your sexual partner or your, or, or, or your partner as well as you can to, to, to want to give your expectations of what you want for sex. I mean, I can't really talk about like, what you girls go through. I mean, yeah, you know, just because I'm me. But like, like I, I won't, I, I'm gay, I won't, I won't understand like, how to... I've never seen one. I've never seen, um, I've never seen an oyster, if I could say. But, <laughs> I really just want to say, all of us are human. So really, it's how, let's say, if I want to say, hey, I want to get down and dirty with you and I want to try this thing new. It's whether you have that avenue to be able to talk to your person that you want to have that. And I think that's the bigger topic I want to say. Whether you could be playful and carnal and, and amazing and honest, and that's what we should try to allude to in our own personal relationships with the people that we are closest to, actually. Uh, I can actually address the first part, what you're saying. But th there is a booming, also, obviously, sex tech um, industry, right? And there are a lot of apps out there that realize that we are so dependent on our, our smartphones, but these apps are trying to foster this communication, um, especially as it relates to sexual well-being. So I think that, uh, the, that even the pe though people are being dependent on their sex, uh, dependent on their smartphones, um, there's also a way to link that back to their sexual health. And there, there is an industry, and there are many companies that, that are doing that. Um, okay, I, I have a question for the panels. Um, do you actually think that the LGBTQ community is actually a more honest and more open and they have more healthy conversations when it comes to like approaching sexuality? And you know, if, if there is, um, could you know, the street community or you know, the society learn something from it too? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I discovered I was bi bisexual when I was uh, 18, 19, so quite late bloomer already. Lah. But I agree with you, actually this is something I was thinking about earlier today. And I realized because that there is an absolute dearth of information about my sexuality, right? I, I like men, I like women, I like everybody. Uh, so okay, the new term is pansexual now, but it sounds like I like pens. But um, I'm happy to look past gender identities uh, and bodies and whatever. Um, and because of the dearth of information, I don't see representations of myself in the media. When I go to school, I don't see representations of myself. They keep talking about reproduction and I'm just like, eh. Um, and then they show us horrific videos of abortion. Um, and, and because there was just so little information, um, but yet I had... Uh, uh, well, I was infatuated with a lot of women, a lot of very cute women when I was growing up, and I was like, why do I feel this way? Why is nobody else talking about this? Am I alone in this? Um, so I had no choice but to turn to the internet, right? Thankfully, I grew up in an era where suddenly there was um, in, uh, computers and internet, so I could research um, about how I felt, right? So I found communities like Red Queen, Sayoni, um, and all these uh, platforms that allowed me to, to find out more about my sexuality. And from those platforms, I also stumbled upon websites about female sexuality. So I took a mirror to look at my vagina when I was very, very young, um, maybe around 11 or 12. Actually, that was before I was bisexual. Okay, timeline a bit messed up already. But um, I, I guess I, ha I was very curious. I started watching porn when I was 11. Uh, I, went to, I was actually in the school library and, and I actually, yeah, I, w I don't know, I was messed up. I'm a very perverse person, sorry. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, but I, I guess 
I'm thankful that I was quite critical about it too, so I was trying to discern like good information from bad information. Uh, and, and yeah, I actually did my master's thesis on porn. Um, and, and just a recommendation, you, there is such a thing called feminist porn. If you have not heard about it, I suggest you Google it. Um, <laughs> And it is, it's not just about softcore, right? A lot of people hear the word feminist porn and they think it's softcore porn, but actually it's not. It is about representing true human sexuality, uh, about representing different bodies, about different preferences, experiences, so on and so forth, uh, to be as representational as possible. Okay, the question was, yeah. Um, but yeah, because of who I am and, and the environment that I grew up in, I was forced to look for more information. And, and I think to cultivate a generation of people who are critical um, and have a sense of curiosity to look outside what they're taught in schools, but also to be able to discern what is good information and what's bad information. Yeah. Okay, just, just quickly also. Um, <clears throat> okay, LGBT. Uh, wow. The, the, actually, by, by and large, right, don't you guys read, I don't know whether you guys feel like, do you feel like, like like the whole system of how our parents are has also taught us a certain way to make things taboo. So the, mari the idea of marriage, the idea of like bearing kids, the idea of like a man and a wife, a man, a man and a wife, man and my wife coming together, have a kid, possibly have a son, so that my name is like you know like like gone through your ovaries and came out and like like that I now you you reproduce for me. Like that system has sort of given you a, a concept that that you feel as if you identify as hetero and fully hetero, that, that, that has bogged down to you on the system that I need to talk about sex in the terms of reproduction and in family. Like, I only can talk about that because that's what ex is expected out of me as a woman um, with, a, with a guy or as a guy with a woman and I need to bear kids. That, that's, that's, that's the pretext of what it is. But why it's so open for us uh, LGBT members, right? It's because we have no system, guys. We don't need to bear kids. We don't need to make children. So in terms of that, we see a finite resource of that conversation with the society by and large that, that is exhaustive. Like there's no need for us to talk about that anymore. That's out of the picture. We don't need to think of the next generation. We just need to think about you and I and all the dirty little things that we'll do to one another for the rest of our lives. <laughs> and that is honestly all we, we talk about. That's why you're right to say because we don't have the premise of a set, I need to marry a woman, I need to bear kids, that is down to a generation before me and before me and before me. We don't have that on us. We are super open to talk about sexuality. We are super open to talk about experimentation. I'm not saying that's what I do. I'm just saying that. In, by and large, that's what most people feel about the LGBT community. They feel that sexuality is something that we, it's just like, Let's drink tea and talk about like that business proposal and then next thing I'm gonna to talk to you about my five sex partners. Like it's like almost it's like just like the next thing we talk about. But honestly, if if um how do we make this relevant for people who identify as heterosexuals? Like how is this relevant for you? What is relevant is that what kind of systems you want to run by? Like who as a as a person that you identify as? Do you be, want to be identified by a system that was passed down to you through generations because of what you need to do to reproduce? Or do you want to say, I own myself? And individualism, in, in by and large, has created a, a, a whole new way we look at one another. Like, in, in, in this sense, like, we are all individuals now. We, are no, we, are, we have our social media accounts, we have our LinkedIn's. We are more than ever like, exposing ourselves to be real, true, identifying as one individual and no longer as a con just a community collective and someone who stands at the back. And for that, right, that comes with more shame, actually, I would say. Like things, you want people to see yourself as like, I'm a progressive woman. I am, I am successful. Um, yeah, sex, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a lot of, I mean, a lot of my friends do that. They don't talk about their sexual lives because it is like, you want to be seen and well respected for your profession and for what you do. And things like sex is so carnal and it's so basic that you don't feel like it's something that you can talk about anymore. And that disconnect is, is, is really what we need to solve. It's, it's how we can both say that we are true professionals who own our crafts and our professions, yet we, we understand we're still carnal creatures and we need to, to be able to talk to that with our, our fellow friends. Even if you want to use like, big words instead of like, hey, did you, today, could you say, 
uh, did you like go? Uh, did you did you did you explore birds and the bees? And like you know, have you uh, have you done things that uh, use big words or whatever? But we need to still talk about it. So I think that that really is that tension point for for society by and large today. Really, yeah. Yeah. So yes, LGBT. Yes, we definitely talk about way more. Yes. So I just want to add that uh, you know we look at the GLBT. Uh, Q as heterosexuals and we think that they are just so out there, they are outrageous, they have no morals but uh, I just want to suggest that uh, people who are promiscuous are just people who have more sex than you. <laughs> so when it comes to why are they so out there, I think it's because they, they have had to fight for everything that they want in their life and the resources that are out there are for them by people who and organizations that see that there is not enough. So even my clients who come to me who identify as GRPTQ, they don't know where to go. So it's not true that there's a lot out there. Why are they so loud? Why are they shouting so loud? Don't they have any shame? It's not that. Actually, it's not enough because we don't know what we don't know. And uh, all of us need to actually be an ally and uh, get equipped and find out so that we can support our friends. I think also you need to differentiate between maybe, I mean, like, so the pansexual or a bi community, but also the gay community, but also like a lesbian community as well. Because I think that they are working here with like She Plus Pride with Smile Makers and even back in my university working with uh, mainly a queer community, you found that women are even more unwill, uh, there is even more of a dearth of, of information for them, not necessarily, but just, yeah, um, for queer women or lesbians. So like they, they believe that like through, you know, oral sex, they can't get, you know, STDs or STIs and that's a very common thread. Um, and there's other, there's other mm. myths abound, um, but it's again, this is a lack of information for them. And so I think it's a bit different between like that community and maybe just like a gay men community that might be a bit more open. Like I think, especially here in Asia, since they, you know, they're not necessarily following in with the familiar uh, traditions or like Confucian values, you know, to have kids or get, have a husband. So they're even under a lot more pressure to, to not be who they are or conform to their, you know, identity. So, um, the, I guess the, the only resolution to that is, is trying to allow them to be a bit more open, to, to engage with them on these topics so they can open up and, and find the right information. Yeah. So as much as I would love to have this run for longer, it's almost actually run for two hours as a panel. So this is actually officially our longest panel that we've ever had. But um, thank you to everyone who's been here. Um, I think that the panelists will be available to catch up for our conversation tonight or we are actually going to be having our social and hopefully they'll be able to come as well. Vanessa is actually going to be speaking at our social event at the end of the month specifically about Project X. Um, we, um, I'm running something at um, the Ultra Super New Gallery in October and she's going to be the charity of record so we're going to be donating some money to them. But um, if you want to speak to the panelists They'll be here, but more importantly, please say a big round of applause to every single one of them. Um, thank you so much for everyone for coming, and we really hope that you found it as interesting, insightful, entertaining, um, and um, you know it, that it, it brings a different perspective to life as you know it right now. So Jacqueline has some products here. Um, if you wanted to take a quick look, if you want to actually know more about Smile Makers, um, that's true. Um, so if you want to know more about Smile Makers, we'll put um, all of their uh, links on our page. Um, with Ultra Super New, their campaigns are already on our Facebook page, as well as they'll be um, issued in our next upcoming newsletter. Um, Vibes as well, their site's on, on our event page, as well as the Facebook page, and with Marta, she is loud and proud on our event page and we've got her LinkedIn details. So just going back to what Project X was talking about, this was some of the coverage that they've gotten and so you'll be able to see it here. And you'll, if you do a quick Google search, you'll see everything. But if there's anything else, thank you so much for coming and we hope to see you at our next panel.